Hi, this is David Evans. I'm the chairman of Global Economics Group, also known as Global Econ. I also hang out at the University of Chicago, where I'm a lecturer, uh, and at the University College London, where I'm a visiting professor. Uh, I also run something over there called the Jevons Institute for Competition Law uh, and Economics. Um, today, as part of our lecture series, what I want to do is to give you an introduction uh, to the hypothetical monopoly test, also known as the um, as the SNP test. Uh, that is the standard test that is now being used in merger and antitrust cases uh, to define markets. It's being used by antitrust and competition authorities throughout the world uh, and sometimes uh, courts. Um, it's not um, um, always the right thing to do, and I'm going to mention some problems with it uh, later on, but what I want to do now is I want to give you a quick introduction to it. So in order to explain this, I'm going to talk about a hypothetical merger between uh, two men's belt manufacturers. Uh, there's Bob's belts and there's John's belts. And these two belt manufacturers will, would like to come together uh, in a merger. And the question for us is, what's the relevant antitrust market for evaluating that merger? Well, to answer that question, I want to make a simplifying assumption. Uh, I'm going to assume that we've all agreed that the market for men's belts is national, so we don't have to deal with geographic market. Uh, that, that way I can just focus on what the relevant product market is. And that question then is what other belt manufacturers or um, other manufacturers of things that hold up men's pants um, should be included in the relevant market. And by saying that, we can't assume that the market is just men's belts. For that matter, it could include suspenders. So how do we answer that question? Well, the hypothetical monopoly test uh, says we start with the uh, the products that overlap between the merging firms, so that's Bob and John's men's belts, uh, and then to figure out what the relevant market is, we start by including some close substitutes and ask the question whether a hypothetical monopolist over all of those products could raise price by 5% or more. So in this particular case, we draw a market boundary around Bob's belts, John's belts, and a close substitute, Steve's belts. We ask the question, is it possible for the monopolist over all three kinds of belts to raise prices by 5% or more for a year or more? If the answer to that question is yes, then we're done. We've essentially defined the relevant market because what we've learned is if the monopolist over these three kinds of belts can raise prices by 5% or more, that must mean that consumers don't have the ability to turn to substitutes either other belt manufacturers outside of this grouping or um, suspended manufacturers or uh, Velcro uh, manufacturers. So we've concluded then that that's, this is the relevant market, or at least the relevant market is no larger uh, than this. But let's suppose the answer to the question is no. The hypothetical monopolist is not able to raise prices by 5% or more. Well, that must be because consumers, when the hypothetical monopolist raises prices, um, are able to turn to other manufacturers uh, to fulfill their needs of holding their pants up. So um, what we do now is we then bring a few more close substitutes in. So we can now think about including Tom's belts and Dave's belts. And then ask the question whether this new circle um, defines the relevant antitrust market. So the question again is could a hypothetical monopolist over Bob plus John plus Steve plus Dave plus Tom's belts raise prices by 5% or more? Again, if the answer is, um, is yes, they could raise price by 5% or more collectively, then this is the relevant market because obviously consumers don't have very good substitutes outside of the market. If the answer is no, we need to continue the process. How far do we continue it? We keep going until we have included enough products that a hypothetical monopolist over them is not able to raise price by 5% or more. Uh, in theory, at least, uh, that could actually take us, as I indicated a second ago, uh, to suspended manufacturers or Velcro manufacturers and, and so forth. Not saying that it, that it will, but at least possibly um, that's, a, that's a possible result. So that's the hypothetical monopoly test. Um, if, you can, if the hypothetical monopolist can raise price by 5% or more, then you're done. You've defined a relevant market. Uh, if not, you need to add more products um, in. Now, one thing you might wonder about is, I've just talked about this in a very hypothetical fashion. How do I actually do this in practice? Well, that's going to be the subject of a 
uh, later lecture. Um, and one of the main things that's used in these is something known as diversion ratios. Um, and that's a statistic that you can often calculate from data that companies have themselves. So oftentimes the sales force is asked to keep track of who they're winning businesses from, who they're losing businesses to, and you can imagine that that data um, is actually a very good proxy for figuring out which of these competitors is, is the strongest. Um, the other thing that's, that's sometimes done is it's possible to go out and do a survey of consumers and ask them um, in a structured way uh, what kind of substitutes they're considering. Uh, that was done actually by the OFT in the Love Films case, which is a very interesting and good decision to take a look at. Now, um, I started out by saying that the hypothetical monopoly test is known as the SNP test. That stands for small but significant non-transitory increase in price. That's a mouthful, so what people ordinarily refer to this as is the SNP test. In practice, um, the small piece of this, small but significant piece of this, is often taken to be 5%, um, and the non-transitory is often taken to be about one, one year. Uh, sometimes a higher threshold is used. Uh, the OFT, for example, uses 10%, just as the department tends to use somewhere in the neighborhood of 5 to 10%, um, depending upon the case. Now, um, the SNP test, like anything else economists do, isn't magic. It's based on assumptions, and you always need to be concerned about whether uh, it's giving you the, the right answer. One of the problems with the SNP test uh, is that it's very, very focused on price, and of course the business of business really extends behind, beyond um, just setting prices. Uh, one of the consequences of that, along with a number of other things, is the SNP test sometimes leads to markets that just seem intuitively to be way too, um, way too narrow. So that's one of the issues one needs to be concerned about. There are lots of other issues in how you actually implement this uh, in practice. Uh, what I've given you today is basic SNP 101. Uh, in a future lecture, we're going to be talking about this in a more advanced way. There's going to be graduate SNP 2.0. 2.0 uh, coming, um, coming in the future, and I would encourage all of you to listen to that. So thank you very much for listening to this short lecture on the SNP test, and um, hope to talk to you all soon.